the courthouse, Wahoo, Nebraska. The hearings begin. Alicia Owen is ready to testify. So too is Paul Bonassi. But there is no sign of Troy Bonner. De Camp discovers that Robert Siegler has sent the young man a threatening subpoena. Fearing arrest for perjury, Troy has gone into hiding. Just try and subpoena my brother's guy. Is Troy okay? Yeah, he's okay. They're just not going to have me testify for after he does. In court, the camp successfully pleads for another adjournment. The county attorney's office begins to search for Troy Bonner, but Robert Siegler won't say why. I'll ask you whether you're about to charge Troy Bonner with perjury. Oh, no. Why isn't Warner coming, Mr. Siegler? You're a public official, aren't you? Mr. Siegler, is it true you are about to charge Troy Bonner with perjury? No, I'm not. Mr. Mr. Siegler, if you do not charge Troy Bonner with perjury, does that mean you accept his, what he's saying is true? No, I'm not. Why are you trying to have Troy Bonner summoned to this hearing, Mr. Siegler? No, I'm not. Why no comment, Mr. Siegler? No comment. Where is that? Every victim witness who stepped forward in any way or even was a potential witness that somebody heard about has either been killed, put in jail under some theory or other, terrified or run out of the state, discredited. Every perpetrator, every perpetrator, even the convicted ones, have been treated as conquering heroes. Obviously, the FBI was protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of old pedophiles having improper relations with little boys. They were protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of drug peddlers. They were protecting, in my opinion, they were protecting some very prominent politicians, some very powerful and wealthy individuals associated with those politicians and the political system up to and including the highest uh, political people in this entire country. In search of answers, John DeCamp goes to Washington to investigate Larry King's powerful connections in the nation's capital. Paul Bonassi has come too. Larry King threw child sex parties at his $5,000 a month Washington house. Paul Bonassi was one of the victims. Larry King's house down in Washington, D.C. was it was, a, it was a nice house. It was on what they, I guess, I believe it was Embassy Row because that's what they kept uh, talking about. There were a lot of flags from different countries when you drove around in the area. So tell me, Paul, how often did you come here? I was about 14, about 1981, and at first it was about three or four times the first year. After that, it was about once a month after 81. And who brought you here? Larry King brought me here. And this is the actual house where you Yes. And what, you were used for sex there? Yes. Some of the parties, when they started off, were straight political type parties with no sex. And then when some of the men had left, some of the politicians had left, the ones that had planned, they had planned on uh, engaging in some type of sexual activity, uh, that would come after the party. Some of the kids would be held downstairs in some of the rooms where if they acted up or if they started freaking out because of the drugs that they were on, they'd put them in a room that they couldn't get out of and they'd lock them in. Were there drugs at these parties? Yes. What kind of drugs? Anything you wanted. Cocaine, uh, heroin, speedballs. You're uh, telling me those speed. things were at these parties where you had Larry King and prominent politicians? Yes. Were they readily available to anybody at the party? They... 
At the after parties, they were ready to label for anybody beforehand. They did it more uh, upstairs than they did anywhere else, and it was kind of in the back rooms. Were any attempts ever made that you know of to, uh, to expose this situation? As far as I know, nothing's ever been done, and most of the people that were in there had already been, I guess you say, compromised. King's partner in sex crime was powerful Washington lobbyist Craig Spence. He took youngsters like Bonassi on midnight tours of the White House. So you were in the White House then? Yes. And how, how did you gain access? Well, I came down with uh, Larry King, but Craig Spence was the one that arranged the trip for us. And it was kind of a, a gift for our services that we were doing. How many times were you on this kind of a trip? I came to it on two times. Two times? And. Were you used for sex on those occasions? None until after we left. After you left the White House? Yes. What it's, time of night? It was usually around uh, midnight. For me, it was just kind of weird being in the White House at that time of the night, and getting to go into places that the guy was telling us that uh, nobody gets to go to. I mean, we've seen, I've seen rooms in there that uh, I'd never even heard about. And Craig Spence and Larry King had a couple of groups. One was called Bodies by God, and they had the Cowboys. And there was another group that was started by Larry King, which was called the Golden Boys, which was kids that were usually under the age of approximately 10. On the trail of Craig Spence, DeCamp finds the investigative reporter who exposed Spence's Cowboy network. Paul Rodriguez of the Washington Times. We had uh, uncovered a, a series of allegations from some miners and it led me to a callboy operation here in Washington. It sure fits with, you know, this boy Paul Benassi. And he tells a tale of being brought to the to the, the White House on occasion, kind of as a reward for the kid. Craig Spence is dead. He committed suicide. He had advanced stages of AIDS. He was an AIDS carrier and he killed himself. This was the thing that always bothered me. They claimed it was the largest uh, male prostitution ring in the city that they've ever, ever had uncovered. It was a million dollars a year minimum. Yeah. And yet they only prosecuted the operator, uh, Henry Vinson, and three of his lieutenants, as it were. Mm -hmm. They never went after any of the Johns or the clients. This operation, which was, again, quite large, claimed to have clients that ran from the White House to the Capitol Hill to the State House to the churches, to, in, within the media. Um, and that's and precisely a lot of, what Paul describes as the people he was with. And a lot of the stuff led there, but we couldn't quite nail it at all cases because, again, to accuse someone of high yeah. stature, you've got to be very careful. I understand. We were able to do it through the, uh, the mother load which provided us credit card receipts and canceled checks and then um, lists of the clients. The prosecutors knew all this stuff. There was approximately 20,000 pieces of doc or 20,000 documents yes. that they had. They sealed the entire record when they found out I was accessing it. They required consent agreements from all the lawyers, all the clients, all the relatives of all the clients, all the hookers, including the clients themselves. Which means you can never gain access. They sealed them by court order. And we have tried, to, we've attempted on several occasions to unseal that, and we've been told to will be a cold day in hell before those records ever get unsealed. And it makes me wonder what's in those records. Yeah.